and amen. Brothers and sisters, continue to watch and pray. Continue to tarry in the presence of the Lord. Continue to wait on the Lord. The Bible says he will renew your strength. And continue to lift up the situation in Europe between Russia and Ukraine before the Lord and asking the Lord for the sake of his remnant in Europe and in, 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 in uh, Ukraine. But the Lord will somehow de-escalate the situation by his spirit. Continue to pray. We lose nothing praying. Asking for the mercy of the Lord in this situation and trusting the Lord that his counsel shall come to pass, his counsel shall prevail and pray above all that the church in this generation shall not be static in religion, shall not be stuck in religion, but shall make progress towards the purpose of the Father. Father in heaven, the great I am who I am, we commit ourselves to you. Have your way by your spirit and speak to our hearts and grant us understanding and let your name be glorified. Holy Spirit, take over the vessels, the vocal cords of this vessel and declare the counsel of the Father. Let the blood nullify the work of the enemy and all the demons assigned to snatch at what is sown. We give you praise, Father, for we know that Yeshua is lifted up and will draw us to where he is. In Yeshua's name we are prayed, amen and amen. Men and brethren, it's important that we continue our study. We are now in lesson 8, sin, repentance, and what about is him. If you understand this lesson today, most likely you receive grace in the revelation of the truth that will enable you to overcome some of the biggest snares of Satan in this generation. And the way the Lord showed me this, and which he's done for some time and repeatedly, is that some of these principles, when people don't understand them, they won't know when they go into religion and religiosity, even though they are born again and spirit-filled. Standing as a giant against personal spiritual growth of saints is a tool Satan uses at will against all, male and female, young and old regardless of race or religion. It is called sin, S-I-N. It makes sense, therefore, for us to gain a walking understanding of this critical adversary that stands between believers and personal spiritual growth. What is sin? Sin can be regarded as Satan's chief tool to prevent human beings from reconciling with Elohim in the first place. Okay, what makes sinners to be stuck is sin. It blinds them. Sin makes them unable to receive his mercy and remain separated from him. But it doesn't end there, and that's where the problem lies. Is that most times, we tend to think of sin in terms of those outside the kingdom. Sin is also Satan's chief weapon to make the fate of sins of non-effect. People who are born again, who are in the Lord, sin is, in, is like a lasso that Satan takes to want to drop believers away from moving into the Lord. So, Satan, we must understand, is the spring and source of all sin. Right from the day he sinned as Archangel Lucifer in the courts of heaven, which led to his expulsion, as described in the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel. You know, when you read them, you understand how Lucifer was expelled from heaven. From that day, Satan became embodiment of sin, rebellion against Elohim. And the way he acted that very time when he rebelled, that nature of sin caused him to deceive, it is believed, over one third of the angels in heaven to follow him in his rebellion. And that's how they became demons. Demons were not created as demons. They were angels who followed Satan in his rebellion. Now, the same thing happened when he was chased down by Michael, the archangel, the commander of the heavenly forces. The first thing Satan did that is recorded in the earth dream is that Satan essentially went about to try to frustrate the people the Lord placed in the earth dream, Adam and Eve, from continuing relationship with him. And so we see this story in Genesis chapter 3, where the story was more subtle. He possessed the being of a serpent as a spirit being, possessed that to begin to engage Eve in a conversation that eventually led to her 
eating the forbidden fruit that the Lord said don't eat. That is what we call seduction or temptation. And that's where Satan peddles sin to spread it is to tempt people. So if you talk about definition and concept of sin, we can say that sin is any disobedience to the express word of Elohim concerning how humans should live in the earth tree. Sin leads to separation from the Lord. Anything done. The concept of sin is truly expansive and incorporates a number of features. One, to do what one is not supposed to do is called sin of commission. What you do that you are not supposed to do is sin of commission. Two, to fail to do what one is expected to do is called sin of omission. Then sin includes impurity in thoughts, in the mind, and the secret purpose of the heart, such as lust. You see, that shows you the superiority of the New Testament over the Old. It says in Matthew 5, 27, 28, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I saw unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in the heart. So the New Testament, you see, the Old Testament, there's so much emphasis on things we are not supposed to do on the outward because it was a carnal covenant. But the new covenant is a spiritual inward covenant. And so the Lord is not only interested in what we do on the outward or not do, but also in the motion of our heart and our mind in their day-to-day relationship with other people. What is it that is going on inside? Remember, Elohim sees he is omniscient. He is omnipresent. Anything that is defiled in his sight is sin. Men and brethren, sin also includes attitudes, dispositions, words, lifestyles, which pollute hearts and minds of others. That includes impure speech, base speech, lewd speech. It includes seductive dressing. If you dress, that will cause another person to stumble, whether male towards women or women towards men, and you dress in such a way to expose yourself, things that should remain covered, it is seen unto you, and it is seen against the people. The Lord is saying that you have a charitable you know, uh, responsibility towards them. You cannot say it doesn't concern me. Uh, that includes other tendencies which glorify Satan, dishonor Elohim, and weakens the faith of others. Um, we are told in the book of Romans 6, 20 to 23, For when, they were servants, when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, be made free from sin and become servants of Elohim. You have your fruits unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of Elohim is eternal life through Yeshua our Lord, Romans chapter 6, 20-23. The wages of sin is death. Sin has an end. End is death, separation from Elohim. Men and brethren, the list of sins named in the Bible is truly expansive. I mean, in the, <laughs> for the Old Testament, there were 600 and something regulations about life in the Torah. You know, the Torah, which is just a little part of the Tanakh, the Tanakh is the entire Old Testament. The Torah is the ones given to Moses. There were 600 and something rules of what you couldn't do and how to do things. And you needed to observe them. If you observe 95% and fail 5%, you are regarded to be a transgressor. Now, contrary to the assertion of many preachers, of the new plastic cross, that is what is rightly called the new plastic cross because they defer, they don't want the old rugged cross where sin is dealt with at the cross. Those who preach the new plastic cross, they tend to give the impression that we are born again, you have a free pass to live anyhow, and there are no rules whatsoever of the Lord. Now, they mix up an issue. The New Testament does not encourage legalism, legalistic Touch not, touch not, taste not, do not. No, it doesn't encourage it. The reason why is that Yeshua came to take away the power of sin. 
And if you receive him, the capacity to live above sin is in that receiving of him. But listen to this. Yeshua specifically declared that the new covenant has higher standard than the old. People tend to forget that. And, it, you know, the old was external based. For instance, Yeshua declared in Matthew chapter 5 from verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, which many people think, or the prophets, which many people think. But he said, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. There are two different things. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us and contrary to us, which we couldn't keep, he came to take it away, nail it to his cross, and set us free. That freedom is not to go and continue in sin. It's the freedom to now go and live in his righteousness with his power, power in our lives. He said in verse 18, For very life is unto you till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in any wise pass from the Lord till it's all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is simple. If you will teach the whole counsel of Elohim, teach that righteousness requires us to walk in responsibility, not to allow sin to rule our lives. He said, you be called great in the kingdom. Then he came, verse 20, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom. You see, the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees was external based. It was to please men. It was to impress men. So they did things to be seen of men. But he said, no, we don't do things to be seen of men. We realize we are before an Elohim who sees, who knows, who is everywhere all the time. And so we are cognizant of that inside our being. Elohim is interested in what goes on inside our being. What is the motion of your thoughts? What is the what are you contemplating in your heart? Because this will dictate what you do eventually. And if you don't do it because others are there, it's because you are fearful of uh, shame and opprobrium that will accompany your action. So what you contemplate in your mind, what you contemplate in your heart, he knows it. And men and brethren, in order to illustrate this, he said in verse 21, for instance, you have heard of, it was said to them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Then he said, and, and then whosoever kill shall be in danger of judgment. You don't kill. If you kill, you'll be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall, whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever that shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. How many times are parents telling their children fool, foolish boy? Foolish, sister, foolish girl. How many times have men told their daughter, you are like your, uh, your, your mom, you stupid girl. He said, you're in danger of hellfire. Then look at this other one. Verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers thy brother had ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. How many times, how many, how much times, because we are no longer studying these things, that Christians are now doing as if it doesn't matter. You know what? It says, hey, he said of you in verse 28, 27, you have heard it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I saw unto you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after had already committed adultery in his heart. Then he went on to say other things. You have heard that if you want to divorce, give a right to not divorcement. But he said, I say unto you, that do not divorce. Why? Because in the kingdom, marriage is a union, is a bond. It's not about people. It is what it is. Men and brethren, read the whole of Matthew chapter 5, all the way from 20 to 48. You will discover that, listen, Christians are living contrary to the world and it's become so normalized. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I saw unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. 
and do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despise, despitefully use you and persecute you that you be the children of your father which is in heaven men and brethren these things look at it very clear the new testament is not inferior to the old it's superior it's just that the paradigm is different Yeshua has gone to the cross to pay the price and he has given us the capacity to live above sin, to live above the pay grade of Satan, to be able to dis recognize his wiles, his devices, and recognizing them to refuse to fall for them because Satan can never lay hold of you and force you willy-nilly to go and sin. He can tempt you. He can try to solicit, try to grab your attention. His devices and his wiles, if you study the Bible and the word is lodged inside of you, you can recognize his devices. The problem is that many times Christians tend to go and, you know, look at the ones people can see. The Lord said, no, I'm interested in your inner life. My kingdom is righteousness, is peace, shalom, is joy in the Holy Ghost. Is it in your heart? Do you have right standing with me on the merit of what the Lord did at Calvary? Do you have peace with me? Do you have peace with people? Do you have joy in the Holy Ghost? In spite of whatever is going on externally, these things I'm interested in. The Lord sees, he knows, and he says, hey, stop all these social media, everyone is righteous in his sight. How is your inner life? How is your inner life? Where are those things coming from? Satan has inserted. So, men and brethren, the end or consequence of all sin is death or separation from Elohim. On this side of eternity, the separation is spiritual. You will sin and do not repent and remain in sin. You are separated from Elohim. You may carry a title. You may have fame and all that. And then once life is over, the separation is physical and eternal. Elohim will spend eternity in glory. Those who lived in sin till they crossed the pearly gate will spend eternity with Satan in the lake of fire and brimstone. And when we are born again, the Lord gives us a precious gift. It is transition from a life of separation from him to one in which we receive the benefit of Yeshua's death at the cross of Calvary, which is reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. That's why he says, if anyone is in Yeshua, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Second Corinthians 5, 17. And then he said in verse 21, because there was an exchange that took place. All our sins were cast upon him, and we drew down the righteousness of Father in him. So it is therefore handling of the word craftily and deceitfully for anyone to use the, any scripture to justify eternal security for a sinning Christian. Hebrews 6, we read it before, you know, in part of, you know, when we're developing this course in the previous lessons, and Hebrews 10. They are very clear. If we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of Yeshua, there is no more repentance for sin. A Christian should never come to a place where you sin willfully. You plot your graph inside your spirit, man. Nobody sees it. You desire what to do, how to deceive. Do that, do that. You do that. It's simply going to eternal separation. That's why. There are some conceptual issues regarding sin in the book of Jude. Those who have the teaching note, you look at it. But the remedy for all sin, the grand remedy for all sin, is the sacrifice of Yeshua at the cross. We need to repeat it again and again. Sinners who are convicted by Holy Spirit believe that he took away their sins and place their faith for salvation on him. They walk away cleansed and recreated. As Romans 10, 8 to 13 says, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 17 to 21, to say also, for those who are born again, the Lord provides grace for life of victory over Satan, over sin, and his seductions and temptations. This he does by releasing grace for saints to recognize the wiles and devices which we said before, and not only to recognize it, but to push back, which is what it means to resist Satan, just as Yeshua did in Matthew chapter 4, 1 to 11. Everyone, Satan tries to suggest something to him. He says, it is written. He pushed back. The Lord expects us to push back. Everything, any way Satan wants to come. 
That's why First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, you know, the Satan walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour, whom we should resist steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are complete in our brethren in the world. So the Lord says to us that there is guarantee, First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that there is no sin that will come and overtake a Christian just like that. The Lord will make a war of escape. The problem of many people is when they refuse the word of escape. Moreover, the Lord has given various promises that he honors repentance. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoever will confess and forsake them shall have mercy. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 to 12. Godly sorrow that works repentance not to be repented of. 1 John chapter 2, my little children. I write unto you that you sin not, the default position, sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua the righteous, and his propitiation for our sin. So the Lord says we ought to come to a place where if anything goes wrong in our walk with the Lord, we should be able to recognize that. So it makes, it makes sense for a sin to be sincere, sincere. Sincerity is what enables us to acknowledge the corrosive nature of the old man, though one is born again. And that's why, you know, if you have time, read Ephesians 4, 17 to 31, telling us what the old man can do. The old man is the body of sin. There's part of man. There's something inherited from Adam that is in everybody. It's called the old man. It's called the body of sin. It will, if it is not dealt with, which is why this course is given as well as course 128, Understanding the Human Nature. If that body of sin is not dealt with, it will give you a proclivity towards sin. Easy proclivity. Because the Lord has made provision for it to be dealt with, which is what sanctification is all about. And that's the point that Colossians 3, 5 to 9 was making. It say, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. They say, mortify, kill it, slay them. They have a root. Deal with it. How? By simply crying unto the Lord. I say, Lord, I don't want any motion of sin in my being. The new nature you're giving to me, I want it to be perfect, correct, thought, word, and deed. Two, you see, when repentance is activated by genuine heartfelt understanding of and godly sorrow for sin, then one can be delivered. Three, when it is persistent, accepting nothing short of real deliverance. In other words, you, you find some things in you you don't like, you know this is not of God, Elohim. Do you just pray one and just go your way? No, you tarry. In the Bible of Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I know, you know, it gives us something, 11 to 13. 13 says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There has to be a persistence of seeking that thing, that attitude, that thing that troubles you. You know, let me tell you. It could be, okay, people speak evil of you, you feel bad, you feel offended. For one day, two days, you can't function. You know this is not good for you. It's not about them, it's about you. You tarry before the Lord and ask the Lord to root it out. Men and brethren, when what is sought, number four, is the full manifestation of the new heart, which the Lord promised in everyday life, thought, word, deed, attitude, emotion, when you desire to be a possessor rather than a professor of the kingdom, as we are told in Ezekiel 36, a new heart he will give unto you. And the promise of Jeremiah 31 is that the Lord will write his law in the heart of his people. And that's what Ephesians 4, 23, 24, 32 also talk about. Men and brethren, the Lord wants us to know there is deliverance, there is provision. And if you want to deliver, if you want to be if you want to grow spiritually, I want to end with this. The Lord was showing me that we must deal with and be delivered from what he calls what aboutism. That's the only human way to describe what the Lord is about to say. I want you to listen. If you missed everything I said, don't miss this one. What aboutism is a tendency to consider what others are doing or not doing relative to the call for spiritual growth and maturity. So how other people you are in human relationship with choose to interpret scripture or respond to the call for personal spiritual growth or maturity is truly their business with him. It's truly. Listen, 
And I don't mean you will rebuke and correct and exhort. No, I'm simply saying, don't ever get to the place where you are so caught up with what other people are doing. If you get caught up, you will get into problem of being a judge and no longer being one who is pressing in yourself. At no way, for instance, does the law permit you to hate somebody because of what he chooses to do or not to do. You know what? As a matter of fact, the problem will be you. Supposing you're a pastor and some people in the church don't want to grow. You do everything. You teach. You exhort. You instruct. You even talk. And they still get stuck there. If you're not careful, if you overlook at them, you'll be like Moses who will see the promised land and will not enter. Because they can bring, they can your overemphasis on them can bring bitterness in your heart, offense in your heart. And before you know it, inside of you, you are not really qualified to preach again because you were looking at them. This is something strange. But the Lord was showing me that this is so important because you don't know about people. The thief on the cross entered the, the kingdom at the last moment. So the people you are looking at, they may just be doing all those funny games they are doing and you may look at them and miss it. And in the end, the Lord may provide an opportunity for them to creep into the kingdom and you miss it. And so the Lord said no. For instance, let's say spouses. The word of the Lord is clear. Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, you know, 1 Peter 3, about the role of men and the role of the woman in the marriage. Do you know that role is so simple and the Lord says, go and do your own. Husband, just go and do your own. Woman, wife, go and do your own. The other one, in your opinion, does not do what you think he should do. If you focus on it, you will end up missing the kingdom. You can give room for bitterness, for anger, for offense, and all this cheap divorce that is all over the world today, that Christians are almost at parity with the world in the area of divorce, including third world nations of Africa. Part of it is whataboutism. Men and brethren, whataboutism illustrated in the book of John, chapter 21, Yeshua called Peter, very, very I saw today, when thou was young, thou gathered thyself and walkest with her, thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall get thee and carry thee with her, thou wouldest not. This spake he uh, signifying by what death he will glorify Elohim. And when he had spoken thus, he said unto him, Follow me. Yeshua said to Peter, Follow me. You know what happened? Verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, see the disciple whom Yeshua loveth which also leaned on his breast at supper and said unto him, Lord, what shall this man, uh, Lord, what is it that betrayed thee? Peter, seeing him, said to Yeshua, Lord, what about this man? What shall he do? What shall this man do? It is what is called what aboutism. Yeshua said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Men and brethren, that was what afflicted matter. What aboutism? Lord, what shall Mary do? Look at Mary sitting there at your feet and I'm doing all the service. Brothers and sisters, spouses, siblings, blood relations, brethren in church, leaders and followers can be engaged in what about is in without realizing it. They may be carnal under a current of who blinks first. In so doing, couples can, for instance, forget that Elohim is present in his omniscience and omnipresence, and that the laws of marriage, for instance, were given by Elohim, and obedience should be unto him, not unto the spouse. Go and check there. He said, woman, submit as unto the Lord. <laughs> it means that even if he's not qualified in your opinion, submit. Man, he said, love. Love, as Yeshua loved the church. So you can't give what about is him, and then you, you, you know, the things you're supposed to provide for the family, you don't do them again. What about is him is what the law say, Satan's chief tool in this generation. It is the grand culprit behind the tendency to judge one another rather than forgive. So instead of forgiving, people judge. And the moment you judge, you can no longer intercede. So we are supposed to forgive, supposed to intercede, supposed to give charity space to cover the multitude of sins. The cure for what about is understanding and embrace of the role of the more spiritual. In every relationship, there's one the father deems more spiritual. It's not the one that knows the Bible more. 
It's not the one that, you know, people know more. It's not the one that seems to have big position in church. You can carry a title apostle, and the one carrying the title minister is more spiritual than you. It is possible from the kingdom point of view. So what does the Lord say? Galatians 6, 1 to 4. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, if the husband is more spiritual, this speaks to him. If the wife is more spiritual, this speaks to her. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's bodies, and so fulfill the law of Yeshua. Listen, Satan has taken away the knowledge of this scripture from the body. So when saints refuse to obey, they resort to finger pointing and become judges of each other, leading to systemic sin and potential falling away. And the Bible says in the book of um, uh, um, Matthew 7, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you met, it shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, but consider not this, the beam that is in thy own eye? How shall thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote from your eye? And behold, the beam is in your eyes, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam from your eyes, then shall you see clearly to cast out the moat out of your brother's eye. So, husband and wife, judgment. Siblings, judgment. Friends, judgment. People, judgment. Because they've refused to do what the Bible says. What about this makes you focus on people to point finger at them. And James 4 says in 4, 11 and 12, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? In other words, when you sit in judgment, pointing fingers, at that very precise moment, you have displaced Elohim. You are staging a coup to take his place because the Lord is able to handle things. And I was asking, and the Lord one day told me that the key issue is this. What about is him and judging one another is simply a manifestation of denying the cross. So people go into marriage expecting board of roses only, for instance. And when they see couples that are, go to holiday together, do all that, that's all they want, they don't know that every couple has an appointed way for perfection. And part of it is your spouse is your cross number one. And at times, the Lord uses your spouse to check you and show you how deficient you are, what you have not yet attained to. You think you have attained to it. And this is one aspect of the gospel message that is lost in this generation. The fact that anyone you're in a relationship with is a cross. Are you going to deny the cross? Or are you going to deny yourself and take up the cross to follow him? You know what? Until you're married, you can never say you're holy. It's when you're married. And when the marriage is to a spouse, who doesn't do exactly what you want. And God of heaven may even, your wife may stand before the Lord doing what the Lord wants, and you may not see it because you are framing her in the context of your own cultural mindset or preference. And this is serious. This is the real deeper training of life the Lord wants us to get to. So the Lord wants us to come to the place where we embrace deeper growth, deeper sanctification, where we begin to walk in true holiness, cleansing our spirit, soul, and body of all uncleanness, where our heart is manifested, and so that what we have is agape. First, Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent charity amongst yourself, for charity shall cover the multitude of sin. Legalism will never make you accept charity, because they are opposites. Legalism is an opposite of charity. The Lord says, leave judgment to me. Love. Love the unlovable. First Corinthians 13, 1 to 13, very clear. So, preaching, teaching, prophesying, if charity is not the driver of it, it says it's mere noise. 
brothers and sisters, we're going to go into some pretty deep stuff the Lord is releasing for our perfection. By way of assignment, please share five things discussed in this lesson that, you know, these things discussed here. Any five that you understood, let us have them. Two, what point or points were most relevant to your needs for personal spiritual growth? You know what, brothers and sisters, the Lord loves us. We cannot define the future for Elohim. We ought to take him. His principles are clear. Under no condition will Elohim embrace hatred, animosity, evil speaking in the heart, evil plot, evil plan. And whether you like it or not, there is nothing that will give you the capacity to know anybody as Elohim knows. And if it is so, we must learn to come to that place where we trust Elohim, that you fix things. Let's say you have a child who is difficult. Do you miss the kingdom because you want to correct that child? You do it, you're missing the kingdom. You have no excuse. You must give room that Elohim alone can change people. Your job is to pray, intercede, war spiritually. Share what you can, but mind how you share it. You don't share it in a way that does not produce fruits. Do you know the Bible says, do not provoke your children to rot. You know, it's possible for Christian, out of desire to make their children what they are not, they can provoke the children to rot and push them further away from the kingdom. You know, these things are true in the Bible. But because we don't talk about them in churches today, parents are just doing whatever they like. And they're expecting that God will rubber stamp it. The Lord is saying, every one of us, leave judgment to me. Embrace the cross that your spouse is. Embrace the cross your sibling is. Embrace the cross that your friend is. And love even the unlovable. Let's pray. Father, Elohim of heaven, we trust you that these things you can, you are not bringing it out for nothing's sake. There is something profound. You want to take us to a place of personal spiritual growth and maturity beyond where we are. Lord, have your way and let your spirit do the work in us. Let your word hit home. Let the sword of the spirit pierce through every hardness of our hearts and touch everyone. Give everyone a second touch, a third touch, a fourth touch, and let there be sanctification with this lesson. Father, we thank you because you are faithful be your measure. Produce a new breed of holy people in your house through this lesson and encourage your children to take it seriously in Yeshua's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, would you kindly share this message to your friends and relatives? This is serious stuff. And two master classes are beginning. Three, actually. One is the normal master class that will be on Facebook. And the director of studies has released the posters. You go to www.kingdombooksclub.com and you can enroll for the master class where we're going to train you intensively. The second master class is the Youth and Next Generation. I mean, it's called the Now Generation Master Class. Nine months, 40 weeks, Saturdays, 8 o'clock London time on Zoom, Saturdays. It's going to be a master class like nothing else these children have received. Specifically designed to produce the Daniel and the Joseph generation of people who can stand before kings and princes, who can lead in public service, who can also lead in the church. And then there's a special one for... Asia, Middle East, and Pacific region, and that one will start next week. These things are part of our obligation to the body. Have a blessed day. We love you. Bye-bye.